Today is part two of Under the Banner of Heaven. Welcome to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl. I'm going to jump right into this. Last week I covered the first half of the Under the Banner of Heaven book and I talked a lot about the TV show as well. In the last video I ended with talking about how the brothers were starting to meet together a lot more regularly to talk about their constitutionalist beliefs, what they thought was constitutional, and their fundamentalist beliefs that, that were growing. The oldest brother Ron was not quite involved yet and his wife Diana pleaded with him to talk with Dan and his other brothers to straighten them out so Ron decided to go and visit them. In the space of a few hours Dan had converted Ron from dutiful saint into a fire-breathing Mormon fundamentalist. Diana told her friend Penelope Weiss that when Ron returned home late that night, a totally different man walked in the door. And this goes back to what I said in last week's video where I talked about the, the similarity between Joseph Smith, how charismatic he was, and how people said that he could sell a muzzle to a dog. And Ron was the same way. He could really convince people of things. And this is just another instance of that. Dan said it was all going to be okay because Ron was going to be called as the next president and prophet of the LDS church and that Dan would be made his first counselor and the other four Lafferty boys would be made second counselors. I think they portray this really well in the show because it does come across as Dan kind of controlling everything but making Ron think he is the one in charge. He is the one mighty and strong but Dan is the one that God has sent to let them all know that. Before Dan brainwashed him, Ron had treated Diana like a queen. He was just one of the nicest men I've ever known, but when this happened, he became one of the meanest men I've ever known, she said. Diana in the show is played by Denise, I think it's Goff, and they did choose to use her real name in the show, and I think she does a really good job of it. When Ron announced that he intended to marry off their teenage daughters as plural wives, Diana reached her breaking point, and desperate for help, she turned to the leaders of her, L her LDS ward and to Brenda. Brenda is played by Daisy Edgar Jones in the show, who does an excellent job, and of course it has her real name. She was raised in a Mormon family, but they were not anything like the Lafferty's. They have a scene in the show where Alan is meeting her family, and that's when you start to see the differences, and he starts to see the differences between the way their family looks at things and does things. And then there's another scene later where her dad is sitting with him with a box of chocolate, and convinces him to eat it because I guess the Lafferty's were not allowed to eat sugar. I'm not 100% sure on that. It shows how there are a lot of things out there that Mormons can't drink caffeine, Mormons can't eat fast food, Mormons can't eat chocolate, and those things are not true. Based on the word of wisdom, they're not supposed to drink coffee or tea, although a lot of people drink herbal tea, and not supposed to drink alcohol or do drugs, but there is nothing about chocolate or caffeine in general, and so while there are families like my husband's family, he wasn't allowed to drink caffeine. He actually got in trouble once when we were dating because I had a Mountain Dew in the fridge. My family, that wasn't a thing. And so that definitely goes different in different families. And so they show that through the show. After Dan persuaded his brothers to adopt his fundamentalist beliefs, all of the wives did end up submitting to one degree or another, even Diana, all except for Brenda. She was the only one that pushed back, which I find so hard to believe. It, it, it does kind of blow my mind that the other wives didn't resist this. He says, intelligent, articulate, and assertive, Brenda stood up to those Lafferty boys, says her mother. She was probably the youngest of the wives, but she was the strong one. She told the other wives to stand up for their rights and to think for themselves. And she set an example by refusing to go along with Alan's demands. She told him in no uncertain terms sh she didn't want him doing things with his brothers, and the brothers blamed her for that, for keeping their family apart. The Lafferty boys didn't like Brenda because she got in the way. On April 22nd, 1982, Alan and Brenda were sealed in the Salt Lake City Temple as husband and wife. She was 21 years old. She'd majored in communications, but when they got married, he didn't want her to work. And so at first he let her have a lower profile file job part-time at Castleton's, a store in the Orem Mall, so that they could have insurance and she could help support the family. But then pretty soon he told her he didn't want her to do that either. He wanted her to be completely reliant on him and he had a successful tile business. While he wasn't doing all the things his other brothers were doing at this point, he didn't have a checking account and he didn't because he didn't want the IRS to tr trace his income and he didn't want to have a social security card and none of that came out until after they were married she didn't know the full extent of his beliefs or his family's beliefs until after they were married and when it came to pay taxes that first year he wasn't going to pay them and then she said yes we are you know you follow the law and so she had her dad help her to prepare their taxes she always made sure that they were doing what they were supposed to do. She resisted him as much as she could. When their baby got sick, he wouldn't let her take Erica to the doctor and it just kept getting worse and worse. 
and they do depict that in the show. Alan's father, Watson Lafferty Sr., had long been afflicted with diabetes and they wouldn't treat it. When he took a turn for the worse, his sons would not treat him and he died. Her mom said that the whole family was beginning to seem evil to her. I'm assuming that was in the journals because I don't think that her family would have known that at the time. And they do depict that in the show. They kind of make it look like they, that the dad is asking for help and that Ron doesn't give him anything. Diana turns to Brenda for help at this point and Brenda is definitely ready to give it because she sees what's going on in her in-laws family. In the show, they depict Ron being angry about Dan's excommunication and not knowing that it was because of his stepdaughters, thinking it's just because of the not wanting to pay taxes and things like that. But he doesn't talk about that in the book and I'm not sure if that happened or not. But then Ron gets excommunicated as well. Ron had quit his job. He was becoming increasingly abusive and he was talking with greater fervor about taking on plural wives himself. Brenda told Diane that she should divorce him and take her children and leave. So relying on close friends, Brenda and members of her ward, Diana did get enough courage to initiate the divorce proceedings. And it was finalized in 1983 and she packed up and moved to Florida with their children. In the show, they depict it as her going to different people for help and that those people would tell Ron and so he found out about it. Again, I'm not sure if that happened or not. It's very likely because I have seen that happen in other people's lives. I do know of real stories where that has happened. So if it didn't happen in this story, that that's probably why they put it in because it is something that happens. In the TV show, it shows his daughter taking all of his garments and cutting out the, the markings on the underwear that are supposed to be sacred markings and cutting those out with scissors. So then he goes and puts it on and it has the holes in it. A lot of people pushed back on that too. Like, why did they do that? And that is not in the book, but that actually did happen. That is something one of his daughters did after he was excommunicated. He decides to visit a colony of polygamists in Oregon. And they do show that it shows him getting baptized in a hot tub and then kissing the man. And we don't know for sure if that happened, but it probably did because that is how that colony is run. This was a Mormon fundamentalist group in Oregon. It's still around. I don't know if they're in Oregon anymore, but it was one where there it was a free love hippie kind of place. And it was everybody, not just uh, heterosexual. So he eventually, I think he took kind of what he liked from this group and then left and returned to Utah. And then Dan introduced Onias to Ron. And very soon thereafter, Ron, Dan, Mark, Watson, and Tim Lafferty were inducted into Anias' School of the Prophets. Alan wanted to be involved, but Brenda put her foot down and wouldn't let him join. Uh, her influence over Alan was messing with what they wanted to have happen in their family. This School of the Prophets would meet almost weekly, usually at the home of the Lafferty's mother, Claudine, and upstairs from the family chiropractic clinic. Ron was just getting angrier and angrier, and they do a really good job of depicting this in the show. Him go from who he was at the beginning to who he is at this point and the rage that was building up in him. And most of it was directed at three people, Richard Stowe, Chloe Lowe, and Brenda Lafferty. Richard Stowe was a pharmacist and a neighbor of Ron and Diana's, and he was the president of their state. And Chloe Lowe was um, one of Diana's friends in the ward, and her husband was the bishop of the ward that they had been in. And he had picked Ron to be one of his counselors. The way he saw it, without those three people's help, Diana would not have left him. So as they're meeting with Anias and other men at the School of the Prophets, they all are being taught how they can get revelation. On February 24th, Ron became the first of Anias' students to take delivery of a commandment from the Almighty. Sitting at a computer he'd borrowed from Bernard Brady, Ron closed his eyes and waited until he felt the Spirit of the Lord cause a finger to depress a key and then another and another. By and by, a message from God inched across the screen, Ron's inaugural revelation. He received a second revelation on February 25th and a third on the 27th. Upon witnessing his brother receiving revelations from God, Dan was spellbound and excited. I never received any ex revelations when we were in the school of the prophets, he explained. Everyone else in the school did, and I've received revelations since then, so now I understand the phenomenon. But it, I didn't at the time. I was fascinated. I'd ask, what's it like? Ron said it was hard to describe, but I remember once that he said, it's like a blanket falls over you and you can feel the Lord's thoughts and you write them down. This was something that stuck out to me reading it and also watching the show. They do show that where he was like, oh, I'm just typing random letters and then it would spell out something. And it feels very demonic, very, you know, Ouija board. And I feel that way about Joseph Smith's prophecies too. And I... The way that he talks about the blanket falling over you, I've heard people t say that. I've heard people use that phrase so often. A mantle falls on you or a blanket falls over you to give you the wisdom in your callings in the LDS church. And so that, that verbiage is very common to the LDS church. And it doesn't surprise me that that's how he would describe it and that that would seem common to the men in the group so that they would think it was real. 
Um, Bernard Brady that he talked about here, he is depicted in the show as a very, very LDS guy. They go to his house um, to question him, which did happen in real life, and I'll get back into that in a little while, but he's very typical a very typical LDS guy, the way that they, he is depicted in the show. So anyway, the revelation that Ron received on February 27th was in fact from the Lord to Ron's wife, he said. God reiterated that the earth would soon be destroyed and this is what he warned Diana through Ron. Thou art a chosen daughter, but my wrath is kindled against thee because of thy rebelliousness against thy husband and I command thee to repent. Have I not said that it is not good for a man to be alone? I will not suffer my servant Ron to be alone much longer for even now I am preparing someone to take thy place. Nevertheless, if thou wilt speedily repent, I will greatly bless thee and thy children. Otherwise, I will remove thee from thy place, for I will not suffer that thy children should suffer longer because of thy disobedience. I have heard the prayers of my son Ron, and I know his desires, and it is only because of his desires that I have spared thee till now. Hearken unto my word, for the time is short. I am Alpha and Omega, even the beginning and the end, and I surely will fulfill all my promises unto my servant Ron. Even so, amen. The thing I find the most chilling about that revelation is how much it sounds like one that would be given to Joseph Smith. This sounds so much like the revelations I've grown up reading about polygamy, when Emma Smith was not up for it, she was threatened to be destroyed. And in the TV show, when they depict that in the history, they do such a good job. It's not accurate to exactly the way it happened when she got the, when she found out about the revelation, but the way that the actress depicts her in that moment was one of the most powerful depictions of Emma Smith I've ever seen, and it's one you'll never see put out by the LDS Church. She looks angry, but also so sad and says he'll destroy me because that is the wording in the Doctrine and Covenants and it's still there that Emma Smith would be destroyed. And now Ron is getting a, a revelation saying his wife will be destroyed if she doesn't do what he would say. I mean, you have to be blind to not see the connection here. On March 13th, the still small voice of the Lord spoke to Ron once again, revealing this. And the thing that ye have thought concerning the one mighty and strong is correct. For I have not said that in these last days I will reveal all things unto the children of men, for was not Moses the one mighty and strong? And was not Jesus the one mighty and strong? And was not my servant Onias the one mighty and strong? And art thou not one mighty and strong? And I will not yet call others mighty and strong to set in order my church and my kingdom. For it was never meant that there should be only one mighty and strong. For there are many, and they who have thought otherwise have erred. But the most disturbing of his revelations would then come in late March, and he recorded it by hand on a sheet of yellow legal paper. Thus saith the Lord, my servants the prophets, it is my will and commandment that ye remove the following individuals, in order that my work might go forward. For they have truly become obstacles in my path, and I will not allow my work to be stopped. First, thy brother's wife, Brenda, and her baby. Then Chloe Lowe, and then Richard Stowe. And it is my will that they be removed in rapid succession, and that an example be made of them in order that others might see the fate of those who fight against the true saints of God. And it is my will that this matter be taken care of as soon as possible, and I will prepare a way for my instrument to be delivered and instructions to be given unto my servant Todd. It just says that Todd was a hitchhiker who Watson Lafferty had picked up. And it is my will that he show great care in his duties, for I have raised him up and prepared him for this important work, and is he not like unto my servant Porter Rockwell? And great blessings await him if he will do my will, for I am the Lord thy God and have control over all things. Be still and know that I am with thee, even so, amen. So again, when I say that the history of the church is wrapped up in all of this, you can see what I'm talking about. Not only do these revelations sound so similar to revelations in the early LDS church, but he's even saying you're going to be like Porter Rockwell, who I just talked about as most likely being the one who uh, was used to kill people for the church. Ron showed this revelation to Dan, and it says, Ron was a little bit frightened by the things he was receiving, says Dan. I told him, well, I can see why you're concerned, as well you should be. All I can say is make sure it's from God. You don't want to act on commandments that are not from God, but at the same time, you don't want to offend God by refusing to do his work. Ron then had another revelation in which he was told that he was the mouth of God and that Dan was the arm of God. Seeking further guidance, they considered a passage near the beginning of the Book of Mormon in which Nephi, the obedient, highly principled prophet who had great desires to know the mysteries of God, is commanded by the Lord to cut off the head of Laban in Jerusalem. I remember I said in last week's video, you need to remember why Nephi was important. Nephi at first resists the commandment. I said in my heart, never at any time have I shed the blood of a man, and I shrunk and would not that I should slay him. But then God speaks to Nephi again, Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Thus reassured, Nephi says in the Book of Mormon, I did obey the voice of the Spirit, and I took Laban by the hair of the head, and I smote off his head with his own sword. This is a story at the very beginning of the Book of Mormon that a lot of people use as a faith story. And I never liked the story, but I never actually stopped and thought about it until I was leaving the church. And it is something that has 
Uh, a lot of people have used the story of Nephi to justify things that they've done this way. And it's just a ridiculous, it's, it's one of those stories where Laban was drunk. Uh, why did he have to be murdered? He didn't. You know, if this was a true story, he was already drunk. Why would God say you have to cut off his head? But they use this story of Nephi, just like others have, to justify what they were being asked to do. Thanks to a revelation that Ron had received back in February, of the story of Nephi slaying Laban was imbued with special significance for Dan, because in that revelation, God had commanded this, Thus saith the Lord unto my servant Dan, Thou art like unto Nephi of old, for ever since the beginning of time have I had a more obedient son. Um, that one goes on a little bit longer, but he was compared to Nephi in this revelation. And then now they are looking at the story of Nephi killing Laban. This revelation had a tremendous impact on Dan after God had declared that he was like Nephi. According to Mark Lafferty, Dan was willing to do anything that the Lord commanded him. When I read that, I immediately thought of a song that we sing in primary, the, the, the classes that are for young kids in the LDS church, a song called Nephi's Courage, where it says, I will go I will do the things the Lord commands. I'm sure that song went through Dan Lafferty's mind, and that is what he believed he was doing. He believed that he was being commanded to do this by the Lord. Having determined that the so-called removal revelation was true and valid, the Lafferty boys further concluded that it would be wise to act on things as it suggested. On March 22nd, just before the school's weekly meeting at Claudine's home, Ron took Bernard Brady into a side room and handed him the removal revelation. So remember, this is Bernard Brady. This is just another guy in the School of the Prophet and had him look it over. So this man knew about it. So that it's, this is a really important thing to know moving forward of how many people knew about this revelation before they were murdered. Uh, Ron had also brought to the meeting a woman named Becky, whom he'd recently taken on as a new spiritual wife um, without, of course, license or ceremony. Watson, the brother, showed up with a pearl-handled straight razor and asked the members to dedicate it as an instrument for destroying the wicked like the sword of Laban. Anaya says that they refused. And I think members of the group are starting to get a little bit nervous now about what, what the Lafferty's are planning, but nobody's doing anything about it. Ron had another revelation that Mark, the brother Mark, was supposed to go to Nevada to wager on horse races to raise funds for that city of refuge under the dream mine. And with the Lord letting Mark know which horse to bet on, they couldn't lose, but of course they did. And so there was a lot of frustration happening at this point, wondering why that didn't work out. During all this frustration, they're all seeing this revelation. And during the meeting of April 5th, he showed the copy to all the members and asked them to confirm its validity. The nine men who were present that evening discussed it and then held a vote to determine its legitimacy as a divine commandment. Ron, Dan, and Watson were in favor of accepting it, said Bernard Brady. Everybody else said, no way, don't even consider it, forget the whole thing. At which point, Ron, Dan, and Watson became really angry, got up and walked out of the meeting, ending their association with the school. That's why I think that in the show, the, the one that's Sam, I think is supposed to be Watson because they show him as being more zealous and kind of crazy. So I think that since he was okay with the revelation, I think that that's why they have... I think that character is supposed to be him. Worried that Ron might actually attempt to carry out this murder, Brady formally registered his concern in an affidavit, which he signed and had notarized on April 9th, and he put it in a sealed envelope. He didn't contact police. He didn't contact any of the family members, and neither did any of the other members of the School of the Prophet. But he had this little affidavit sealed so that when the police came, they could sh he could show them that he wasn't for it, that he wasn't okay with it. And they do depict that in the TV show. Later that month, Dan took it upon himself to inform his youngest brother, Alan. So this is Brenda's husband. They'd always been especially close. And so Dan went to him and told him about the, the order to kill his wife and his child. It says that Alan expressed shock and asked why particularly why Erica, being an innocent child, why should she be involved? At which point Ron cut in and said, because she would grow up to be a B word, just like her mother. Dan earnestly asked Alan what he thought of Ron's revelation. Alan replied that because he personally hadn't received any such revelation from God, he wouldn't accept it. He said he would defend his wife and child with his life. So he's saying, okay, well, God didn't tell me this and I'm gonna protect my family. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't tell his wife that this revelation was made about her. One of Brenda's older sisters said that she's never been able to reconcile that he withheld this information. And most of his family believes that she would have left had she known about this revelation, which I'm sure we all can believe would have happened. At this point, Ron and Dan left to go on an extended road trip around the Western United States. 
and visit other polygamous fundamentalist groups as they prepared to do these killings. In the show, they depict a few things that are not in this book that are interesting to me. They show Brenda and Alan meeting with high up church leaders down in Salt Lake at the church buildings and them giving her a blessing. And I, I went back in the group to try to find what the sister had said about this, but I couldn't find it. So I'm gonna have to go off memory from like two years ago. But she did say that that was not true, but that they did know somebody high up in the church and they came to her. So she did get a visit from top church leaders. She didn't say who they were. And she was given a blessing that did tell her she needed to be a support to her husband and that she needed to help the Lafferty's change. She and these church leaders would not have known that they were planning murder, but she was thinking of leaving her husband. These church leaders convinced her not to and that it was her place to stay and help the Lafferty brothers to change and give up these ways that they had. Also, it does show her and her sister meeting at McDonald's and her sister telling her, you need to honor your temple covenants to your husband and not leave him. And of course, again, she didn't know the level of abuse and everything that was happening, but this sister said that she would regret that forever. That did happen. They didn't know about the full extent of abuse and all the things that were happening in the family until after she had died. But they do depict those in the show, and I think it is an important depiction because they are things that were based on true things that happened. While Ron and Dan are, are gone on this long trip, which they don't show in the TV show, Dan remembered that Ron was getting more and more agitated and seemed like he was becoming more bloodthirsty and he would say things like it's going to happen soon and and he started to believe what day he was going to do it and he said the 24th of july is when it's going to happen as i observed ron going through these changes and the things he was saying they were really freaking me out all i could do was pray i asked god look you know i will do whatever you want me to do should i stay with my brother and carry this thing out or should i separate from him and have nothing to do with this and the answer I got was to stay with Ron. Dan would have been brought up to believe that if he prayed about it and felt that he was supposed to stay with Ron, that that was God talking to him. Dan starts smoking pot, and that is something that you normally wouldn't do in the Mormon church. Dan said that, that his curiosity was aroused for pot because of the Doctrine and Covenant section 89 for the Word of Wisdom, because it says, Verily I say unto you, all wholesome herbs God hath ordained for constitution, nature and use of man. As he reflected on the various references to herbs in Joseph's published revelations, he became convinced that the prophet, quote, must have come across some of the mind expanding herbs. I found that so interesting when I read that in this book. I do speculate a little bit, along with some other people that have, that in the early church days, that there may have been some herbs or mushrooms being consumed that were causing hallucinations. They go to a couple of different uh, polygamous groups on this road trip and Dan ends up finding another woman that he convinces to be his a wife for him. She said about him he was so gentle and so loving. It's so hard to imagine that about this man that we know murders a baby. He goes with her in a car for a little honeymoon and Ron goes with some other people they've picked up and with her children that she had in a different car and then they agreed to meet up in two weeks. By the time they meet up they've already decided to part ways and not be married anymore. Ron has brought along a guy named Ricky Knapp and they find another drifter and petty thief named Chip Carnes. That woman and her children are out of the picture but he still has Ricky and Chip. So they get back to Utah. Dan goes up in Spanish Fork Canyon to visit his other wife there and then after spending a day with her he says goodbye and he goes to Orem to visit Matilda and their children. That's his original wife. In the show she goes by Matilda but it actually might be a fake name in both the show and the book. There is a lot of speculation that that's not her real name. And then Ron and Dan and Knapp and Carnes all go to the mom's house to do laundry and tune up the car's engine. And they discuss their plan for the next day. And my question when I was reading this, does that mean that the Lafferty mother knew of their plans as well? Because we already know that all the men in the School of the Prophets and even Alan knew about this removal prophecy and didn't do anything about it. But what about the mother? What about, but what about Claudine Lafferty? And then on the next page, he writes, on Monday evening, the four men sat at Claudine Lafferty's dining room table while Ron and Dan conferred about the removal revelation. As the brothers talked, Claudine sat on the nearby sofa knitting. Although she listened intently to the conversation, she said nothing. So Betty Wright McIntyre, the sister, said that she heard all of this for the first time when 12 years later, she listened to Carnes testify from the witness stand at the fourth district in Provo. And she said, how could someone hear what they were planning and not do anything to warn Brenda? Dan, at this point, wondered why it was necessary to cut their throats, to kill these four people. 
And why couldn't we just go in and shoot him? And Ron replied that it was the Lord's command that, that it's done this way. So July 19th had been Brenda's 24th birthday. So she's just turned 24. The baby was now almost 15 months old and it just started to speak. Carnes told Ron, I don't see any reason for killing the baby. And Ron replied that Erica was a child of perdition and therefore needed to be removed. And in any case, he added, not only had God specifically named the baby in his commandment, but after Brenda was killed, the baby wouldn't have a mother. So it would be in fact a blessing if Erica was removed along with her mom. They loaded the station wagon, the four men climbed in and they went to Mark, the brother's house, and they asked him for a gun. He said, what are you gonna do with that? And they said, we're going hunting. So then they drove off. Um, Mark did not come with them, but they went to a nearby gravel quarry and were just shooting their guns for a while. And around 1.30 in the afternoon, Dan eased the Impala into Allen's driveway in front of the brick duplex he and Brenda rented on a quiet street in American Fork, Utah. So this was Pioneer Day. Pioneer Day is a holiday celebrated in Utah every July 24th that commemorates the saints coming into the Great Salt Lake Valley when Brigham Young brought the people here. And in the TV show, they do depict the, the detective with his daughters on the yard playing on this day before he gets the call to go investigate this murder. I've seen a lot of pushback from people being mad about what the girls are wearing that they say that it, it's not how Mormons dress and that it makes us look crazy um, because our pioneer dresses. But the thing about that criticism is that it was pioneer day. It's completely accurate in the 80s or now to have little girls dressed in pioneer dresses on pioneer day my own daughters have gone to pioneer day celebrations in pioneer dresses that was actually a very accurate depiction so they go to her house dan has a boning knife tucked into the left boot but no one answered the door so ron knocked on the door but she didn't answer and so he turned around and came back to the car puzzled shrugged his shoulders dan said I had a real happy feeling because I thought the whole thing had just been a test of faith and Ron had passed it. And I said, oh, thank you, God, and started the car and drove away. But then as he drove away, he had a strong feeling that he should turn the car around. So he did. And he knew he was going back to the apartment, although he didn't know why. The other guys in the car all asked him, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going back to Allen's, but I don't understand why. A number of things went through my mind. By this point in time, I'd had enough spiritual experiences, things that I considered miraculous, that I believed I was going back for a purpose. I thought, well, maybe Ron wasn't supposed to do it. Maybe I'm going back because I'm the one who's supposed to take care of this business for the Lord, which would make sense because it said he'd be the arm. I had a real comfortable feeling about what I was doing. At this point, it was like someone had taken me by the hand and was leading me comfortably along. Ron asked me if I was sure about what I was doing. He said he didn't want me to do anything he was unwilling to do himself. But I explained I felt good about it. It felt right. So they pull in the driveway again. Dan goes up to the door this time and knocked and Brenda opens it. Dan asks if Alan was home. She says, no, he's at work. And he asked her about a gun, a deer rifle. And she says she doesn't know. He asked if he can come in and use the phone. And she said, no, you can't. He recalls, I was kind of silently talking to God. And I asked, what do I do now? It felt comfortable to push past her and enter the house. So that's what I did. Chip Carnes said that as soon as Dan forced his way into the apartment, they heard what sounded like somebody hitting the floor and a vase breaking. And Dan says that he felt impressed to wrestle her to the ground. So Ron got out of the car at this point, went up to the door and he tried to go in, but she was blocking the door. So he had to push his way in. And he comes in, he hears her screaming, don't hurt my baby. And you could hear them beating Brenda up. Ron shuts the door when he comes in and says, what are you doing? And I and Dan said, I feel like I'm fulfilling the revelation now. Then Ron said, how are you going to do it? So I asked him to give me a minute to pray about it. And I said to myself, what am I supposed to do, Lord? I felt impressed that I was supposed to use the knife. Again, this wording is very important with how people talk in the LDS church. It gets very violent here. I'm not gonna read what they did. Um, to either of them, but they do beat her. And Dan said he didn't really have any bad feelings toward Brenda or Erica, but he was just doing God's will. He said that he felt like he was supposed to kill the baby first, but he didn't know where to go because he'd never been in their house before. And so he said that he felt led by the spirit right to her bedroom and he did. So he killed the baby and then he went back and killed Brenda and it's extremely violent. And they used the way that the blood oath would say. When they left, they said, we have two more residences to visit. As they drove, Ron began to regain his composure. They made sure they weren't going over the speed limit so they wouldn't get pulled over. And they went to where Chloe Lowe lived. In the book, he takes a break from it and he goes back into the history and spends more time in church history again, talking about when the saints left Nauvoo and about Brigham Young. I'm not gonna go into all that. I am gonna be reading another book later about the saints crossing. And so I, I, I'll i talk about that more than at that point. So I'm not gonna read all this, but then he, but he does go into the fact that they still weren't open about polygamy in the church yet. And historian D. Michael Quinn said that the people were lying and he, they called it lying for the Lord. And that Brigham Young once famously bragged that we have the greatest and smoothest liars in the world. I would argue that they still do. And then he goes into 
how they wanted Utah to become a state and, and what they had to go through to become a state. And he talked about when Brigham Young first admitted to polygamy and declared that one day it would be believed in by the more intelligent portions of the world as one of the best doctrines ever proclaimed to any people, which is a false prophecy, obviously. He talked about how there were a bunch of saints in Britain that were being baptized that were abandoning it during the six months following the announcement because they had didn't believe that polygamy was real until they heard that. By 1855, that polygamy was not only being practiced openly, but urged on the faithful with an unrelenting hard sell that included dire warnings. If any of you will deny the plurality of wives and continue to do so, Brigham threatened, I promise that you will be damned. Brigham Young really did seem to have an obsession with blood atonement, and he talked about that a lot. And so he goes through that in here. He talks about Wilford Woodruff observed in 1856, all are trying to get wives until there is hardly a girl 14 years old in Utah, but what is married or is just going to be. And again, that goes back to what I said, that 14 seems to be that number you see coming up over and over again in polygamy. The government is definitely pushing back and federal officials were dispatched to Utah to ride herd over the saints and were aghast at what they witnessed and complained to their superiors that Brigham had transformed the territory into a theocratic di dictatorship. But the majority of these Gentile office officials, many of whom were corrupt to the core and had come to Utah intending to enrich themselves, faced such unrelenting harassment that all but two of them eventually fled Utah altogether, fearing that if they stayed, they would receive an unannounced visit from Porter Rockwell and turn up dead, which in fact happened to an undocumented number of federal agents. Go back to the book I talked about, the Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock book, Study in Scarlet. So he's just going through a lot of politics here that Utah was a pro-slavery, no matter what people here think, it was pro-slavery at first. It was a slave territory. He talks about what would be known as the Utah War, which was these heavily armed soldiers were to escort officials into Salt Lake City and subdue the saints if necessary. He then goes into the story of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. A wagon train was coming through Utah and and these Mormon men went and killed everybody except for the smallest children. And this is another story that I will probably make another video on later after I read a, a different book about it. But you, if you wanted to research it or read this book, you'll find out all about it, of this wagon train of men, women, and children that were slaughtered by Mormon men. There were some Paiute Indians that were involved at the beginning. It all ended up being blamed on the Paiutes and the church did not take accountability for it for a very long time. So in this book, he, he spends quite a few chapters on the, the history of this wagon train and what happens here and then what happens afterward and how Major John Wesley Powell, a Civil War hero, when he was doing an expedition in the Grand Canyon, they had some men that deserted and they ended up dead. And so he goes through the whole story of them and how they found out that that also was blamed on a nearby tribe, but it was found out that it was men in, from a church in a nearby town that were afraid that what they had done at Mountain Meadows was going to come out. And this paranoia that was happening in Southern Utah over all of this. And so again, like I said, that goes to the study in Scarlet. If you read that book and you wonder if the story in it could be accurate, it, it is. It's all based on what was happening in Utah at this time and the paranoia and the murders that were happening. The man that eventually became the scapegoat for the church was a man named John D. Lee, who Brigham had taken under his wing and kind of considered an adopted son. Lee was ended up being killed for this, but he was not the one that ordered it. There is a lot of speculation on whether Brigham Young himself ordered it or not, but it doesn't look like he did because they sent a letter to him about it and he sent one back saying to leave them alone, but it didn't get there till afterward and nobody knows for sure whether that was real or not. It goes through a lot of that. There is a part in the show where they show this man coming into Mountain Meadows and picking up an infant skull. And a lot of people push back on that as well, saying, no, they, they left the youngest ones alive, but actually they didn't. Some of, the, some of the babies and children were killed then too. And then after that, he spends a few more chapters again on polygamy and the end of polygamy and how they made a manifesto saying that they weren't going to be doing polygamy anymore, but then secretly sent people to Mexico and Canada. And we went over that before. And so he goes into a lot further detail on that. Again, you can watch my polygamy videos to get that whole story. I don't want to necessarily go on to that in this again. Chapter 21 starts out with a quote from Mikkel Gilmore that talking about the Mormons said they have a history of astonishing violence. And I think you can see that through this history that he goes through in this book and that they show in the TV show. I never knew how violent the Mormon church history was before I left, before I started finding out things and left the church. I thought that the only violence in the early church was the violence against the Mormons. I didn't know how violent they actually were. So he goes through a lot of this and says, a look backward at the history of Mormon fundamentalism shows that its adherents have been splintering into rival sects ever since the first group of diehard polygamists themselves broke away from the main Mormon church a century ago. 
And so again, this is bringing it all together. The book is bringing together the church history of polygamy, the church history of violence, all of these polygamous sects, all of these fundamentalists, what do they have in common? They all believe the same thing. They all have the same core fundamental beliefs as the LDS church. And they have just taken that violence and that polygamy and all of those things and they still do it. He goes on to talk about the LeBarons. There's a recent documentary about the LeBarons. They're the ones that Herbal LeBaron was called the Mormon Manson. And they went around putting out orders of death on people. Three of the seven LeBaron brothers would eventually at, at one point or another call themselves the one mighty and strong. After going through all of that history again, he gets back to the story of the Lafferty's. The police were considering Kenyon Blackmore and Bernard Brady as prime suspects along with everyone else that was connected with the School of the Prophet. And so that was the route that they were taking at first. And of course the show does depict this as well that they were going and questioning Bernard Brady. The next chapter, he starts with a, a quote from a man named Will Bagley. Joseph Smith bequeathed his followers a troublesome legacy, the conviction that it was the kingdom or nothing, and the belief that any act that promoted or protected God's work was justified. So after murdering Brenda and Erica, they knew that once they had fulfilled the entire commandment, that it, the way would be open for them to build this city of refuge. So they went to Chloe Lowe's house, but nobody was home. They'd gone up to their summer home on Bear Lake, near the Utah-Idaho border. And so they removed a window and Dan and Knapp disabled the burglar alarm, entered the house and ransacked it. They stole a $100 bill, a watch, car keys, and some jewelry. And in an act of spite, Ron destroyed Chloe Lowe's collection of porcelain figures from Dresden, Germany. And then they went to go to murder Richard Stowe. But Knapp was driving and Ron gave him directions. Knapp missed one of the turns and Carnes, who was growing increasingly anxious, begged Ron to forget about the remainder of the revelation. If the Lord wanted you to kill someone else today, he pleaded, you'd already be there. To his surprise and immense relief, Ron concurred without argument and told Knapp to continue in the direction he was heading, which would take them to Interstate 15. Had they turned around and driven to President Stowe's residence, they would have found him at home. So they ended up driving to Reno, Nevada. The two drifters that they had picked up that were here with them this whole time, they were getting anxious. They didn't really want to be with Ron and Dan anymore. So they waited at the hotel until Ron and Dan were asleep. And then they went out and they pushed the car down the road a little bit, got in and drove away. And as they drove, whenever they found murder weapons and paraphernalia, they threw it out the window. Four days later, the police spotted the car parked out front of the house that they were in. They raided it and arrested them. And they quickly agreed to reveal everything they knew in return for a promise of leniency. So because of the information they gave, they were able to find the murder weapons and all the things that they had thrown out of the car and then go to Reno to arrest them. They also had gone to Brady's house and that is where they found that affidavit where, that he had notarized on April 9th. And then they were, went to the house where Ron had been squatting before they had gone on the road trip. And that is where they found a flannel shirt with the yellow legal pad paper with the revelation on it written in the pocket. And that is how they knew about the revelation for the death. For the next two weeks, Ron and Dan were in Sparks and Reno and they were gambling. And then these police officers came in and arrested them. You'd think this would be a cut and dry. They go in, they have their trial, they're you know, executed or put in prison for the rest of their life. During the original trial in 1985, Ron's court appointed attorney had tried to do an insanity defense, but he didn't want them to. And the only witness that they had left for their defense was their mother who broke down and cried on the stand and then perjured herself by professing to be unaware of what they had talked about. It surprised nobody but Ron when the jury returned after deliberating for just two hours and 45 minutes and announced that they had found him guilty of all charges, including two counts of first degree murder. They would keep having appeals. And so he goes through all of the appeals that they would have through the years. And he said in August of August 5th of 2002, Ron would be hustled again into the courtroom and he's 61 by this point. More than 17 years have passed since Ron was first sentenced in the same courthouse to be shot to death for murdering Brenda and Erica Lafferty. Yet here he is, still belligerent among the living. This book came out in 2003 and he wrote that the execution had to wait and was expected to be carried out as early as 2004. So he thought it was gonna happen soon after this book came out. But actually it was it kept being appealed over and over and it, he probably would have been killed in 20. 20, but Ron died of natural causes before he could be killed on November 11th, 2019 at 78 years old. What about Dan? From the time of their arrest through 1985 convictions, neither man would confess to anything until 
than mid-1990s when Dan's attitude and outlook look had changed and he accepted that he was going to spend the rest of his life behind bars. He believed his conviction and imprisonment were crucial components of God's plan for mankind. And as a consequence, he became willing and eager to talk honestly and openly about what happened. By 1995, Dan had come to believe that Ron was a child of the devil, an agent of Satan who was bound and determined to kill Dan in order to prevent him from fulfilling the rest of the vital mission that God had given Dan. And he had a good reason to believe that because one day Dan was lying in the bunk trying to sleep and Ron tried to kill him in the in the cell and so he had reason to believe his brother was trying to kill him and like I said they showed that in the TV show but they showed it at a different time but at the core of Dan's faith was his newfound conviction that he was Elijah the biblical prophet known for his solitary ways and unyielding devotion to God and as Elijah Dan is certain it will be his job to announce the second coming of Christ in the final days according to Dan in my role as Elijah, I'm like John the Baptist. Elijah means forerunner, the one who prepares the way. John the Baptist prepared the way for the first advent of Christ. I'm here to prepare the way for the return of the Son of Man. I'm sure I will be the one who will identify Christ when he returns, he says. According to Dan, a year or two after he was incarcerated, he had this experience. I didn't know what it meant at the time. I was just pacing my cell. It was the middle of the day and I heard a voice. It was completely different from the revelations we were given through the school of the prophets. I was pacing and I heard this voice tell me, write this down, the moon will shine from noon until nine. That was all I heard, and over the years I thought, what does that mean? And finally it came together and made sense. I recently figured it out, just in the last year or so. The sign of Christ will be that the moon will shine in the sky from noon until nine at night. How that will happen, I don't know, but when it happens, I'm sure it won't be mistaken for anything else. He also figured out why Ron tried to strangle him with a towel in 1984. It was because the devil had revealed to Ron that Dan was Elijah and had been assigned to let the world know when Jesus returned. I feel confident, Dan declares, that this is what was behind Ron's attempt to take my life because the Bible says that if Elijah doesn't fulfill his calling, Christ can't return. I believe I'm a good person, Dan insists. I've never done anything intentionally wrong. I never have. At times when I've started to wonder if maybe what I did was a terrible mistake, I've looked back and asked myself, what would I have done differently? Did I feel God's hand guiding me on the 24th of July, 1984? And I remember very clearly, yes, I was guided by the hand of God. So I know I did the right thing. Christ says, if you want to know if something is true, believe, and I'll help you know the truth. And that's what he did with me. I'm sure God knows I love him. It's my belief that everything will work out and there will be a happy ending to this whole strange experience. I've just had too many little glimpses through the thin fabric of this reality to believe otherwise. Even when I have tried not to believe, I can't. Serene in the knowledge that he has led a righteous life, Dan Lafferty is confident that he won't be festering here in maximum security much longer. He is sure that any day now he will hear the blare of the trumpet heralding the last days, whereupon he will be released from this hell of strip searches and prison food and razor wire to assume his rightful place in the kingdom of God. Dan is the one that did the murders and yet he's still in that prison. It has been moved, I think I said that, from the point of the mountain, it's not there anymore, but he is still in the Utah State Prison as of right now. He ends the book with this, the Mormons gained so much by abandoning polygamy that it is hard to imagine LDS authorities ever bringing it back by design. Mormondom's path is set less these days by theologians and wild-eyed prophets than by businessmen and publicists. It's so true. The LDS Church has an annual revenue estimated at more than $6 billion, and it is currently the largest employer in the state of Utah. For the better part of a century now, the church has been trending slowly but relentlessly toward the humdrum normality of middle America. But the mainstreaming of the Mormon Church has a distinctly ironic component. To whatever extent the LDS religion moves beyond the most problematic facets of Joseph Smith's theology and succeeds at becoming less and less peculiar, fundamentalists are bound to pull more and more converts from the Mormon church's own swelling ranks. I thought that those were such good paragraphs because, well, he talks about six billion. They have over $150 billion now in the LDS church and growing, but I do believe it is ran only by public publicists and businessmen. If you look at the men that run the church, they all are lawyers, or businessmen, doctors, things like that. And I believe what he said is true, that the more that they try to normalize themselves, the people in the church that have more fundamentalist leanings and are more obsessed with Joseph Smith and the early church and know what it was really like, they will start going more that way. I think that it we will see more of this. We've seen it a lot over the past couple of years with Chad and Lori Daybell. We've seen it with Ruby Frankie that was abusing her children recently. These are all people that were mainstream LDS people. Chad and Lori Daybell say that they went to the temple before every murder. And Jody Hildebrandt that was involved in Ruby Frankie's abusing of her children, she worked with the upper church leaders. And so people like this are still in the church. And I believe it's going to start coming out more and more. Some final notes I have about the TV show. It does show a lot of interference in the case by church leaders. 
And I'm not sure if that happened or not. I couldn't find out anything about that. Probably didn't happen exactly the way they show it in the TV show. However, we do know that in abuse cases over the past few years and other things that have come up, that there is a lot of interference by church leaders in cases. And so, and there, you can, it, you don't have to dig very deep to find the proof of that. And so I wouldn't put it past having happened, but I can't say for sure whether that was true or not. Another thing that I found very interesting in the show is that the, the lead detective, when his children are preparing for baptism, it shows them going in and having an interview with the bishop. And then he asked to talk to the bishop by himself for a minute afterward. He wants to delay the, his daughter's baptism. And they do a really good job of showing social expectations of that, of how they're treated for not doing the baptisms right on time and how it, how it feels to him and his wife and their relationship as he's starting to have these questions. But in it, the, the bishop tells him, you won't be led astray by the church leaders. And he's trying to comfort him with that. And there's been some pushback from that too, from people that watched it that said, oh, he wouldn't have said that. And yet, uh, that's a very famous quote in the church that is used a lot. The church leaders won't lead you astray. And that comes from a talk from Wilford Woodruff, who was a church prophet at the time. He said, we won't lead you astray. I'm not kidding when I say it's used consistent, like constantly people say that. The funny thing about that, that a lot of people don't know is that on the exact same day that Wilford Woodruff uttered those words, he had signed the pri in private the recommendations for the plural marriages in Mexico. So on the exact same day that he was saying, we will never lead you astray, God won't allow us to, he was signing recommends for people to do secret polygamy after telling people they weren't doing polygamy anymore. I think that tells you everything you need to know about the LDS church, the way it's always been ran and the way it will continue to be ran. And I think that John Krakauer does an excellent job in this book of showing you church history, showing how it relates to this case. You can see the, the fingerprints of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young all over the Lafferty's and what they did. And over these other fundamentalist groups of polygamists, they all come from the same place. They are not just coming up with these ideas on their own. They are going to the teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and that is where they are getting them. In the modern Mormon church, they are trying so hard to distance themselves from the fundamentalist groups that they forget that that is where they came from. Warren Jeff's group is closer to the early church of Joseph Smith than the modern LDS church is, but they, people don't think about it that way. And so I think that's why th stories like this are important to showcase that and make sure people know that. And so I think it's a very good book. It's so well written and engaging. If what I have shared in these two videos has interested you, you at all, I would encourage you to read the whole thing. I have spoiled a lot of it, obviously. I haven't read you even the smallest part of it. So I would recommend reading this if you're at all interested in it. And then if you think that you can handle the show, like I said, I would check out the content warnings on IMDb and see if you can do it. It is very well acted and it is very well put together, but it is hard to watch. If you've made it this far and watched both videos, I would love to know what your thoughts are on this. And if you have read this book, if you've read anything else by John Krakauer, if you have watched the show or if you're, if you're planning on reading it or watching it.